you young people, God bless you for using your talent for the Lord. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Numbers. I really need your prayers. Uh, I guess my health's the worst it's ever been. Some of you are aware of the fact I had another breakdown a few months ago. I tell you, it was so bad until I actually said to God, I said, if I'm not going to get any better, let me go home. I was really suffering. It was bad. You know, J. Wilbur Chapman, J. Wilbur Chapman had 13 breakdowns in the last 16 years of his life and died when he was only 59. So I shouldn't complain. I'm 73. That's a good bit older than 59. But I am, to God be the glory, I am ready to go home. I'm ready. I hope you are. <clears throat> Open your Bibles. The book of Numbers. I didn't know. I didn't know this was uh, y'all's anniversary of having been here 43 years. So I hope this message will be all right. <laughs> it's kind of strong. And I've never preached it before. And uh, so you pray for me, please. Numbers, chapter 32, verse 23. Paul said, I'm sorry, Moses said, Moses said, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Amen. Like I said, I've never preached this before. But probably this is needed in the day and age in which we're living in Amen. as much as it ever has. Much as ever has been. Look at the last part of that verse. Be sure your sin will find you out. That's what I'm preaching on. I'm preaching on be sure your sin will find you out. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. You may be seated if you want to. I'll lead us in a word of prayer. Would you pray in your heart as I pray? Only God can make this service what it ought to be. <clears throat> You'd notice probably already how raspy my voice is. Well, that all happened when I had this last breakdown. God in heaven, Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. God, I thank this great church. I thank these are precious brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, there's no people like your people. God, I thank you for making me always feel at home here. Thank you, the people here made me feel at home here. I thank for giving Brother Lawson and I a kindred spirit. Thank for this good man of God. Thank for giving him and Miss Lawson 43 years here and give them many more years. God, I pray that you'll keep them right here until Jesus comes or they go home. Father, I pray God help us to be faithful unto death. Father, help us to never give up. Help us to never quit. Father, it's our burden to the end. And I thank you, God, for the privilege to be saved and know it and the privilege to live for you and save it. Father, it's wonderful to be saved. Nothing like it. Father, if anybody here lost, in Jesus' name, save them. Please don't let anybody here die without God and go to hell. Please, God, give us a greater burden, a greater love for lost souls. Help us to stand between the living and the dead or stand in the gap, make up the heads. Help us do what we can in these last days to try to keep people out of hell. 
Now please see to it that everyone that has come gets spiritual help. Please bless everyone here. Please, God, encourage everyone here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> You say, why well, put your message like this? Well, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. It's better to be worn. It's better to stab the trap than to have to try to get out of it after you get in it. Someone said, Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. How true that is. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. God said, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to his spirit shall of his spirit reap life everlasting. You reap what you sow. You reap later than you sow. You reap more than you sow. You read in the book of Job, where I believe it was Eliphaz, said, they that sow to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Folks, I'm telling you, we better stay out of sin. You'd be better off to go out here and find your den of rattlesnakes and play with them to play than to play with sin. Amen. I'm telling you on the authority of the word of God, be sure your sins will find you out. I'll just know the several ways in which sin will find you out. Number one, be sure your sins will find you out in your conscience. You've got a conscience. You've never seen your conscience. I've never seen my conscience, but I'm very aware of the fact that I got one. Anytime I sin, my conscience bothers me. I'm telling you, it'll drive you up the wall. Your conscience. Your conscience is not a God, but it sure is a good going. See, your God is right here, this Bible. Right. See. <clears throat> See, the Bible tells us in Acts 23, verse 1, Paul said, Brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until today. Can you say that? Can I say that? Can you say you've lived in all good conscience until this day before God at death? Well, I'm telling you what, it's good to go to bed at night with a clear conscience. You sleep better. You sin against God, you go to bed at night, you may not be able to sleep. People run to the drug store, they run to the liquor store trying to silence their conscience. You won't silence it that way. You have to come to Jesus Amen. and confess your sins. Your sins will find you out in your conscience. I remember when I was a kid, you laugh about this and this all. When I was just a kid, my daddy, and I can't remember who the other man was because I spent a long time ago. But my daddy and this man were going to go to Macon County over around Montezuma, Georgia to get some peaches. So I went with them. They got several crates of peaches. It's unbelievable how many crates of peaches they got. I wish I had some of them now. <laughs> they line them things up in the back of the truck kind of like that, you know. I don't know why, but for some reason I was stuck in the back of the truck in the middle of all them peaches. 
And there were so many crates of peaches in there until I couldn't see my dad and he couldn't see me. So I got real mischievous. Going down the road and back in those days, that's been a long time ago, probably 60 years ago, or no, no, it's been longer than that. On those farms, I came up on one, they had a number of houses down the dirt roads. People that worked on the farms lived on those houses. They plowed the mules and things like that and picked the cotton and other things. We came down that dirt road and I got to look at them houses. And back in those days, a lot of people didn't have air conditioning. A lot of them didn't even have fans. Them old houses had old plain wooden doors. They'd leave them, leave them open in the daytime. They had old wooden shutters, no, no glass window. And them things would open out, you know, like that. They had hinges on them, and they let the air come in. I got to look at them pieces. I said, that piece right there is no good. I picked that thing up. I was coming down the road, and I ran back and took that thing right through the front door. <laughs> <laughs> when I did, some of the young people in the house come running out there, man, looking, thinking, what in the world's going on? <clears throat> we went on home. Nobody ever knew I threw them pieces but me and God in my conscience. <laughs> but what many days after that, Dad and I was in Vida, Georgia, our county seat there in Dooley County. And Daddy was talking to the chief police, who was a great big old man, Chief Cross. And I stayed over there at the truck. I was about to go over there. Because I just knew when I seen that police, I just knew that he knew I threw them pieces through them doors. And I thought, surely he's going to come get me and put me in jail. I was scared to death. I'm not making it up. You know what was wrong? My conscience was eating me up. Back years ago, this man who owned this restaurant, he was greedy, had an awful love of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, by the way. Yeah. Money is not to be our master, it's to be our servant. That's right. Yeah. Right. So this man told the people that worked there in his restaurant, he said, you slice the meat thin. He didn't want to give them the money's worth. He wanted to make a lot of money, you know, for nothing. Kept telling them, you sliced the meat thin. And they did. They didn't give the people the money's worth. But when that man was dying, I want you to get this. When that man was dying, here's what that man was saying over and over and over. He wasn't even conscious. But he was saying, slice the meat thin. Slice the meat thin. Slice the meat thin. I'm telling you, be sure your sin will find you out in your conscience. There was a girl one time in, who left the mother and broke her mother's heart to go to Toronto, Canada, to live where the action, you know, was, bright lights and the mouth, loud music and wine, women in song. And, and uh, so one day, after having been there for some time, one of her friends said, let's go to a singing tonight. She said, okay, I'll go. I went way up in the stands. It was a huge stadium, arena, or something of that nature. And as a group started singing something like this, my mother once, my mother twice, in heaven she rejoiced. My mother once, my mother twice, in heaven she rejoiced. Boy, that girl remembered what a good, godly, sweet mother she had. Her conscience spoke her. She jumped up. Ran down those steps out of that stadium, went on out on the street and ran and ran past the lights, gas lights back in those days a long time ago, and kept running and running and ran on out into the country and fell dead in front of a farmer's house. The conscience had literally hunted her to death. Be sure your sins will find you out. If you're living in sin, I'm going to tell you your conscience is going to Drive you up the wall one of these days. Yes, 
your conscience is going to catch up with you. I was reading here recently. Well, back a long time ago, this man worked in this factory. And he was what you call a stoker. He had to put the wood in the furnace. Then he took a poker and was stirred up, you know. And the factory hired a man who was uh, a man who had poor character. One day that man was in there, that stoker was stoking that fire, and that man started making fun of him. Kept picking on him, making fun of him. I mean, he just wouldn't stop, just kept on and on, and finally he got the best of that man. He grabbed that poker and hit that man over the head. But he hit him harder, I think, than he meant to, and he killed that man. Boy, he looked, see if anybody saw him. He knew he was in big trouble. But he thought, I know what I'm going to do. Nobody's looking. I'm going to put this man in that furnace, burn him up. Nobody will ever know that I did this. So he took that man, put him in that furnace feet first. He got to putting his head in there. His head fell back. And the man's eyes was looking right at that man. Now, he was dead. Don't misunderstand me. But his eyes were looking right at that man. That man never forgot that. Every time he put wood in that furnace, every time he opened the door at the furnace, he could see that man's eyes looking at him. Next thing you know, his conscience got to eating him up so bad until he told the folks, says, I got to go on a vacation. I just I got to take a vacation. They let him go. And what he did is he wound up gone for four years. That man went up to Chicago. He went to the Great Lakes. He went on over to Montana. He went over to Washington, Oregon, California. He came back over to Mexico and Texas. Eventually made his way back home. And he went back to the very place where he killed that man. He was a good stoker, and so immediately they talked him into going back to work there. And he did. And every time he opened that door, he could see that man's eyes. His conscience wouldn't let him alone. Finally, one night, he and some of the others slept in the same room that worked in that factory. So finally, one night, while he was sound asleep, he started talking in his sleep. It woke a man up in that room. He listened closely. And here's what that stoker was saying. I killed him and burned him in the furnace. I killed him and burned him in the furnace. I killed him and burned him in the furnace. The man overheard him saying that. He woke another man up. He said, don't you listen to what this man's saying. He did. I killed him with a poker and they burned him in the furnace. Boy, they went and got the law. The law came in there and heard that. He woke that man up. He said, sir, you're under arrest for murder. That man said, you can have me. He said, oh, God, he said, I have had no peace for years. Be sure your sins will find you out in your conscience. For we're about to stay out of sin. Amen. The Bible says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. I pray that. I said, oh, God, help me to hate evil. Help me to hate sin like you hate it. Boy, I'd like to finish my course down here with joy. As Paul said, I don't want to get in sin. Amen. Right, amen. Boy, I got a number of friends that have gotten in sin, some of them preachers, and they ruined their ministry. I don't want to do that. 
Be sure your sin will find out in your conscience. Secondly, be sure your sins will find you out in your character. John 8, 34, Jesus said, Very, very, I send you. He that committeth sin is a servant of sin. You start committing sin, next thing you know, you'll find you're a slave to sin. It'll affect your character. Well, I tell you what, I meet a lot of people in these days, traveling up down this country. You can look in their eyes and tell that sin has taken a toll upon their character and upon their body to their health, too. You know, the countenance is the index of the soul. You can look in some people's eyes and tell what's going on on the inside. You can look in some people's eyes and tell they don't have character. Now, folks, reputation is what people think. Well, character is what God knows well. Well, when I think of someone who had character, I think of Job. He was the man that God himself bragged on. God said to the devil, he said, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him in earth? A perfect man, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Oh, I love that. That's character, folks. Amen. Think of character. I think of Abraham. Friend of God, the father of the faithful. He had character. Amen. When I think of character, I think of Moses, meekest man on earth in his day. He had character. When I think of character, I think of Joseph. Probably the most perfect type of Christ in the Bible. Over 100 similarities between Joseph and Christ. He had character. When Potiphar's wife, wife tried to get him to commit the awful sin of adultery, the Bible said he fled and got him out. Amen. The Bible says flee fornication. That's what you young people need to do. When you're on a date, listen, young people, please, when you're on a date, don't let that boy put his hands on you. Put a Bible between you. One young man, a preacher's son, as he was beginning to get a little older, you know, noticed there were some changes in his body and one thing or another. He went to his daddy and said, Daddy, what I'm on a date, what do I do with my hands? He said, put them in your pocket. I like that. I like that. That's what I did when me and Ellen was dating. My wife. Some of you will think I probably ought to have been on one of the covered wagons. That's all right. We're still together. <laughs> been married over 50 years. We're still together. But on the night before we to get married the next day, I walked up on the porch. I said, goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow. I didn't kiss her. Made up for it since then, but. I gave an anniversary card here recently. In that card I said, to Ellen, my wife, the love of my life. Amen. I was off preaching somewhere back, oh my, it's been probably a year or two ago. And I always call her before we go to bed at night. I always call her. My day's not complete till I talk to my wife. One night I called her, I was in a good mood. I called her up. I said, honey, I love you. And I said, when I get home, I want some sugar. <laughs> well, ain't nothing wrong with that. Oh, God, that's what's wrong now. People trying to get sugar from everybody but their own wife and husband. 
As a result, we got a mess. Amen. Your sins will find you out in your character. I want to show you something now. Turn to Revelation 22, verse 11. I, I really want to show you something. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. Notice what it says. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Hey, the word of God's not telling you if you're unjust. Then just keep on being unjust. That's not what that's saying. If you're 50, just keep on being 50. No, you know what I believe it's saying after having studied it? I believe it's saying that when you die, you're going to experience for eternity what you did here when you was lost. If you were drunk while you were here and you died a drunk, died lost, when you go to hell, you'll always be a drunkard, but in hell you won't get one drop of liquor to quench your thirst. People who would have been drug, drug addicts all their life, die lost, die drug addict, go to hell. Throughout eternity, they'll be wanting a fix, but they can't get one. Tell you what serious business. Amen, serious business. God's not playing games. Be right. sure your sins will find you out. Now hurry. Be sure your sins will find you out in your carcass. I felt reluctant to use that word because it sounds like a dead animal. I got one of my thick dictionaries down and, and read what it said about carcass, and here's what it said. It said it means the body of a dead animal, but it also means the body of a living human being. Sound like a little ration. I don't use it every time. I didn't use it when I preached in a camp meeting this past Wednesday night. But anyway, coming back to where we were, your body is a carcass then. And your sins will certainly find you out in your carcass, in your body. I've seen people out here that was obvious that sin had taken a toll on their body, on their head. Some of them look like the maybe 70, 80 years old and may not be but 50 years old. Sin, I ate you. Sin will destroy you. The Bible says the soul of sinners should die. The wages of sin is death. That's the word of God, folks. Your sins will find you out in your carcass. Some of you have heard the name. I know Brother Lawson has. Dr. R.G. Lee used to pastor the great Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. Dr. Adrian Rogers was there for years and years after that. And I don't know the pastor there now. But back before that, Dr. R.G. Lee was pastor of First Baptist Church in New Orleans. About everything he preached then went out over the radio. <clears throat> One of his so-called fans, very wicked, wicked, ungodly young man, only 18, 19 years old, <clears throat> was writing some of the nastiest letters. That man called himself the chief of the kangaroo court. One day, Dr. Lee got a phone call from the charity hospital there in New Orleans. Nurse said, Preacher, there's a man down here in this hospital is dying. He won't give us his name. He calls himself the chief of the kangaroo court. He wants you to come down here. 
Dr. Lee said, I'll be there. He said, I went down there and walked into the room where just an 18, 19 year old boy was. He said, I looked in some of the wildest, weirdest eyes I've ever seen in my life. He said, I said, hello. And I've heard Dr. R.G. Lee preach this in person. It was in his message, payday someday, one of the greatest messages I ever heard in my life. So I remember how he sounded when he illustrated this. He said, hello, and that boy said, howdy. And Dr. Lee said, is there something I can do for you, young man? He said, nothing, nothing at all. Let you throw my body out to the buzzers. When I die, if they'll have it. <clears throat> Dr. Lee said, I sat down by his bedside and talked with him, sat there two hours. And he said, all of a sudden, there's an awful rattle in his throat and chest. His eyes looked glassy. He screamed and hollered. He said, he grabbed my head and held on it for dear life. And then he said, he was gone. Then at two hours, that young man told Dr. Lee, he said, the reason I want you to come down here is he said, I want you to tell young people all up and down this country that the devil pays in counterfeit money. All the devil's pearls are paste pearls. Yes. Yes. You eat the devil's corn, he'll choke it with the car. Devil's your enemy, he's not your friend. He's my enemy. I've been pushing on him a good bit here lately because he's been doing all he can to try to destroy me, and that's the honest truth. I read where this man got run down, so he went to his doctor. doctor looked him over and said he could tell he smoked a lot you know if a person smokes enough man you smell it at a distance <clears throat> he said I guess you blame your run down condition on hard work don't you he said yes I do yes I do doctor smiled he said I want to show you something reached into jaw and got a leech he said, by your arm. He did. Put that leech on his arm. The leech began to swell. Then in a little bit, he quivered and fell dead. That man said, oh, he probably wasn't healthy. The doctor said, oh, yeah. Reached in your jaw and got two leeches. Stuck two on his arm. The more leeches went to work. In a little bit, one of them fell dead. Then it went long before the second one fell dead. Shot that man. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Then that doctor said, look at them. They're dead. You poisoned those leeches. He said, in essence, he said, you've got poison nicotine in your blood and every smoker has it. You say, if you believe smoking sin, I sure do. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God done warn you you're not to defile your body. I need to hurry. Next of all, be sure your sins will find you out in your children. Proverbs 29, verse 15 says, A child left himself will bring his mother to shame. Daddy, Mama, would you please read your Bible and pray with your children? 
the great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon said of family altar, he said, if you begin at seven, they'll probably be saved by 11. If you begin at five, it'll probably begin to thrive. I read the Bible and prayed with our children when they were home. Both of them are saved. My daughter, believe it or not, my daughter got saved in San Austin while I was reading the Bible, praying with her. She got her condition. We got her on knees and prayed with her. She got saved. Somebody said family altar alters the family. The family that prays together stays together. Daddy, I hope every day you'll get your family together, whether it's in the morning, noon, or whether it's at night. Say, come on, we're going to read a chapter in the Bible and we're going to have prayer. I hope you do that. You can't take that nice house you got to heaven. You can't take them fine clothes with you to heaven. You can't take that job of yours to heaven. You can't take all them boats and motors and cars and one thing or another to heaven. You can't take your money with you to heaven. The only thing you can take to heaven is your family. Don't let your family go to hell. Now, next of all, be sure your sins will find you out in court. On television, they have a program called, I think it's called, what, Forensic Science or something like that. And I stand amazed sometimes how they finally figure out who committed murder and things of that nature. It's shocking. Through DNA and other things, sometimes just one hair. Unbelievable. One fingerprint. See, it reminds me of another true story that's really happened <clears throat> years ago. This man had a circus, and he was in a town, I believe it was in Louisiana. <clears throat> had his tents all up, and circus was going on, and he had a Himalayan ape that was a real pet. And one day this man and his wife, for some reason or another, wanted to kill that man who owned that circus. So they did. And when they did, that egg was looking right at him. He went in a rage. After that, every time that ape saw that man and his wife, he went in a rage. When they were finally taken to court, there was not enough evidence to really convict them. And they were thinking about letting them go. But apparently somebody must have told them about that eight free actions when he saw them. So they literally brought that ape into the courtroom. And the minute he saw that man and his wife, he went into a rage. On those grounds, they convicted that man, that woman, put him in prison for life. Be sure your sins will find you out. They can find you out in court. Amen. So you may think you've got it hid, but you don't have it hid from God. Amen. Abraham Lincoln said you can fool all the people, some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Somebody wrote on that, you can't fool God any of the time. Be sure your sins will find you out. Amen. Then last of all, be sure your sins will find you out in a Christless eternity. If you die without God when those books are open, you're going to be judged according to your works. You're going to be judged according to all them sins you committed and all the light you've rejected. 
And if you don't get saved, you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you'll suffer in hell forever. Forever. No end. Oh, God. It pains me in the heart to see so many people lost and going to hell. I literally beg God every day to save the millions in America that are lost without God and going to hell. Oh, God. Every day I say, oh, God, please give me a greater burden, a greater love for lost souls. And I pass out tracts everywhere I go. I've already passed out a number of tracks over here at the motel where I'm staying. When I got here yesterday evening, I went over to the Cracker Barrel and ate and passed out a bunch of tracks there. A lot of tracks. Sometimes the manager stopped me, and that's okay. But most of the time, I get by with it. I just care about lost souls. This morning I walked back there to, to get some water. A man walked to that track rack, started pulling tracks out. I said, I like that. I was impressed. Every one of us is saved ought to fill our pockets up with gospel tracks. Pass them out everywhere you go. Folks, don't you realize that we're rubbing shoulders with people every day that are going to eternal burning hell. Burn forever. The Bible says, who should dwell with the divine fire? Who should dwell with everlasting burnings? Everlasting burnings. That man in Luke 16, when he went to hell, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue from Tormented in these flames. Read Luke 16. You'll find the word torment three times in that passage. Hell's a place of torment. 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 Abraham said, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus even things, but now he's confident now, tormented. He said, remember, remember, I believe that's going to be one of the worst things about hell. You're going to be able to remember every time you had a chance to get saved and you didn't do it. That'd be one of the worst things about hell. You'll be in hell and you'll be thinking, oh, I could have got saved, I could have got saved. I heard them. I heard the preacher preach, and they gave the invitation. I could have walked down the aisles and knelt in the altar and asked Jesus to come in heart and save me. I could have got saved, but now I'm beyond the hope of mercy. I'm beyond the mercy of God. I never have another chance to get saved. Oh my! I wouldn't be in your shoes for all the money that Bill Gates worth, and he's worth billions of dollars. Why go to hell when you can go to heaven? Amen. I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart you won't be in hell five seconds before you wish you'd never been born. Jesus said of Judas Iscariot who went to hell, he said it'd been better for that man if he'd never been born. Please wake up. Please. Be sure your sins will find you out. They're going to find you out someday. Would you stand your feet? It's about eyes closed. Musicians are come. I have a word of prayer with you while they're getting ready. Some of you may want to come to the altar while I'm praying. Why go to hell when you go to heaven? Why wait till your sins find you out? Why don't you come to this altar and confess them? The Bible says, he that confesses his sin shall have mercy. Father, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving my soul. Father, I thank you. I thank you right about going to hell now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, precious Jesus. 
Father, in Jesus' name, please save those here that's not saved. And those of us that are saved, there's any here with unconfessed sin in our life, help them to run this altar and confess it right now. Oh, God, help us realize our sin's going to find us out someday. Speak to our hearts, God, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Father,